Uh, so, hi everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to our Wednesday seminar. So, uh, today uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Nicholas McDonald, who's uh, reaching out to us from the beautiful city of Bonn and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. So, uh, Nicholas is a currently a, st a staff scientist at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, he is originally from Canada. Um, he spent six years in uh, Boston for his PhD, where he got, uh, got interested in um, relativistic jets. And then he moved to the, to Bonn, the Max Planck, first as a postdoc and now as a staff scientist. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about supermassive black holes. Uh, relativistic jets, the Event Horizon Telescope, and uh, all, all the good stuff. So, uh, Nicholas, th thanks again for thank you. accepting our in invitation, yeah. and uh, the stage is yours. Great. Well, th thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a real honor to be able to uh, to present in your 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 seminar series. And just um, you know, a brief outline uh, uh, of my talk. You know, this is, is is a talk that's mainly focused on jets, and so I'll I'll introduce the basic concepts of of jet synchrotron radiation uh, and very long baseline interferometry, which is sort of the, the workhorse of this science. And then uh, I'm gonna discuss or introduce some, some non-horizon scale jet science that I'm advocating for uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope. And uh, I spend my day with uh, observers, but I'm very much a theorist. And so I'm gonna touch on uh, two numerical techniques that I use uh, to model relativistic jets. Um, the first of which is magnetohydrodynamics, uh, and the second of which is particle and cell. And these are very different uh, uh, numerical techniques, and they have their strengths uh, and their weaknesses. And so I'll, I'll touch on that in the talk, and then finally end off with where I think, um, at least from a theoretical point of view, uh, jet research is heading moving into the future. But by way of introduction, just, you know, my talk title is obviously a reference to, uh, to Star Wars. And so it turns out that nature is also able to produce uh, highly collimated beams of, of plasma in this case. Uh, and the, the central engine powering uh, these jets, um, which are, are, are immense in scale, uh, is believed to be a supermassive black hole. And so two years ago, we have uh, through, through VLBI, uh, the first image uh, of the shadow of a black hole. This is, this is M87. And uh, more recently now, we have an image of the polarized emission uh, of this uh, inner region uh, of, of M87. These, these lines that you can see here, this is a wind plot. This is a sort of a, a way of illustrating um, the orientation of the linear polarized emission that we see associated with this, this uh, inner plasma. And so polarization is kind of the larger arc uh, of my research. And so the EHT is a, a globe spanning array of, of millimeter wave uh, telescopes. And the Max Planck here in Bonn has a major part in running uh, APEX, uh, which is a millimeter dish uh, located near Alma in, in Chile. And the most recent uh, EHT campaign actually just concluded um, you know, a few weeks ago. And so this was an image taken at APEX uh, of the, the EHT data from the most recent run being loaded up. And uh, so I think the, the campaign was, was, was successful. The weather cooperated for the most part. And so that data will uh, slowly make its way to the, the correlator group here in Bonn. And so hopefully there'll be some, some very exciting new results to see uh, in, in the near future. And so the EHT is broken up uh, into working groups um, uh, you know, that covers a range of science and, and instrumentation and, and technology. And uh, my own home within the EHT is, is the AGN working group. And so, you know, obviously the main thrust of the science with the EHT is, is, is looking at horizon scales. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested uh, in, in the, the ability to do non-horizon scale science uh, at these, these, you know, these, these higher frequencies with the EHT. And so I'm very much interested, you know, in the jet and what we can learn uh, by moving to, to one millimeter global VLBI. And so that's kind of where I fit into this, this, this larger framework. And it's a real pleasure to be a part of this in, in some small fashion. So it's a, it's a truly international effort um, with a lot of uh, uh, you know, hardworking people. So just, you know, but I'm, I'm about jets. And so that's kind of the focus of, of my talk. And so just you know, a brief introduction uh, to jets and, 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 and synchrotron theory and, and, and VLBI I think is, is in order. 
And so my, my own interest in jets um, started on much smaller baselines. Uh, this is an image of the, uh, the JVLA in Socorro, New Mexico. And uh, this is a, a JVLA image of, of, of the radio galaxy Cygnus A, which is really kind of where I got hooked uh, into jet science. And these jets are, are truly immense. Uh, they are extra galactic in scale. And again, just to give you a, a sense of the size of, of, of these uh, immense outflows. And, and that really kind of begs the question, what on earth is going on in the center of this galaxy to, to, to drive these immense energetic outflows into, into the far reaches of, of extra galactic space? So a big part of the answer to that question came um, with the launch of the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Space Telescope uh, in 2008. And so Fermi has, um, for more than a decade now, been monitoring um, you know, the gamma ray sky, so the very high energy emission. And so this is a, a map that I love uh, of sort of Fermi's view of, of the, you know, the whole sky. And so you can very clearly see the plane of the Milky Way um, but if you ignore the Milky Way and all the, the interesting physics that goes on there, all of these point sources um, off of the plane of the Milky Way um, are radio loud blazars. And so these are relativistic jets that happen to be pointed more or less uh, directly at the Earth, and, uh, and they're highly variable. And so it's, uh, it's a lot of fun kind of comparing and bringing together VLBI uh, and, and high energy gamma ray uh, astronomy, you kind of bookend the entire electromagnetic spectrum, but there's a lot of physics there. Uh, and that's sort of where, where I'm, I'm, I'm living. And so kind of the standard paradigm is that you have a rotating supermassive black hole that collimates and launches uh, a relativistic jet along which blobs of plasma propagate. Uh, and if you have all of that pointed more or less directly at you, uh, you get what we refer to um, as a blazar. So what does a blazar look like uh, through the lens of an interferometer? So um, this is, is obviously an image of, of not the, the EHT, but the, the VLBI. So not global VLBI, but sort of continent. Uh, scale of VLBI. And, and the real genius of this technique uh, is to use the rotation of the Earth um, as part of the telescope. And, and with this in place, you can, you can build up what we call synthetic aperture synthesis, uh, and you can create very high resolution uh, images uh, of these relativistic outflows. And so when one does that, um, year after year, month after month, I, I highlight the date progressing here. This is uh, images uh, from the Mojave program, which is a de dedicated uh, blazar monitoring program. And so what we see in, in synchrotron emission is, is typically a bright stationary feature uh, that's known as the radio core. And then over time, we see these relativistic jets uh, propagate away uh, from this standing feature or features within the jet. And so kind of in broad brushstrokes, this is the morphology uh, of what these blazars look like uh, in, in the radio. So I, I, maybe some of you heard before, but my, my previous off office mate, well, Carolina Casadillo was my, my previous office mate, but my office mate after her uh, was uh, Thalia Treanu, who's a, who's a Greek and is now in Spain. And, uh, and Thalia and I kind of share a love of, of science photography. And um, uh, Thalia shared this image or this movie with me, uh, which I'd like to share with you, which I think beautifully illustrates some of the core physics uh, of, of what I'll be discussing today of relativistic jets, uh, but with a soda pop bottle. So it's very much a, a non-astrophysical context, but, but I think it gets the point across. And so what we're looking at, this is, this is an animation, so I'll play it for you, is, is, is basically a pressurized bottle blasting off. And so you'll see it move um, you know, from, from right to left. And so this was captured um, with a very high precision camera at a rate of 50,000 frames per second, uh, which it has been slowed down by a factor of 2000 for this animation. And the thing that's really cool about this sequence is that the color technique that was used in the imaging uh, is such that it highlights densities uh, in the gradient of the fluid. And so I'm just gonna play this. And, and what you can see is this, this toy rocket blasts off is at the very nozzle of the jet, if you want to call it that, we see a standing shock, which is highlighted in red. It's conical in nature. And then after that, you kind of see what we refer to as a rarefaction fan in blue. And because of the symmetry of the jet, you get multiple sort of standing shocks. We refer to these as recollimation shocks in the jet. It's a result of the mismatch in pressure between the plasma, the fluid in this case, uh, and the surrounding medium. And so I, you know, I do all these fancy numerical uh, simulations of jets, but I feel like all you really need is a, is a soda pop bottle. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of a, a cool image to, to start the talk with. 
And so here's another example of these standing shocks. This is a, a, a Saturn V rocket on the way to the moon. And again, this is a, you know, a non-relativistic unmagnetized plasma, but it still illustrates the idea that we, you know, and you have a, a jet of highly moving um, fluid, uh, you do see these features. And so in my mind's eye, I like to, to rotate this image around uh, and think about the jets uh, that emanate from these supermassive black holes. And, and the question that we ask is if the radio core that we see in these VLBI images uh, is somehow in an astrophysical context analogous uh, to these standing shocks uh, that we see uh, in, in smaller scale jets. And so from a numerical perspective, I run relativistic magnetohydrodynamic jet calculations, which sounds all fancy, but really they're just, it's just the nozzle calculation. It's just a soda pop bottle with magnetic fields. Um, and, and we see these, these types of standing shocks uh, in these simulations. And so the big question that I, I try to address in my research are do these shocks have anything to do um, with these, these sort of synchrotron morphologies that we see uh, in the VLBI uh, images? So, you know, we're astronomers, so we can't fly out there and, and, and measure things directly. And so for better or for worse, um, we're stuck with the middleman of synchrotron radiation. And this is my favorite image of, of synchrotron radiation. You know, radio astronomers, you see these, you know, radio contour map after radio contour map. It's all very esoteric thinking of, you know, interferometric visibilities and, and, and UV coverage. But this is what we're looking at here uh, is synchrotron light. So we're looking through the porthole uh, of a synchrotron reactor. So you have a beam of high energy electrons um, being blasted into a, a magnetic ring. Uh, and then the end result of which is, is the, the production of, of synchrotron light. And so I, I really like thinking about this just in terms of, of optical synchrotron emission. And so this is obviously something is, is akin to this process is happening on a, on a cosmic scale in these jets. And so this is probably my second favorite image of, of synchrotron radiation. Uh, which is the very inner core region of the Crab uh, Nebula. So this, this, that's the Crab Pulsar there, which is kind of this Manhattan-sized neutron star. And we're looking at the inner region of this, uh, this supernova remnant. And this blue haze that you see uh, is optical synchrotron emission from a, a cosmic sea of electrons, uh, which are gyrating uh, in magnetic fields that surround this, uh, this remnant. And so synchrotron radiation is, is very much uh, what we're detecting with these interferometric um, arrays. And so in terms of what we're measuring uh, for the non-radio astronomers uh, in, in the audience, of course, it's, it's electromagnetic radiation, but what we're really focused on uh, is, is, is the electric field. And that electric field can carry polarization with it. Uh, and that tells us a lot about the, the physical conditions uh, in, in these relativistic plasmas. And so the synchrotron radiation can contain a, a linearly polarized uh, component, uh, but it can also carry with it circularly polarized emission, or perhaps no polarization at all, or some combination of the two. And so that's, uh, you know, that's what we're measuring. And so we, we kind of parameterize uh, you know, the, the, the nature of this synchrotron emission in terms of the Stokes parameters. And I, I love this image, which kind of sums it up nicely in an astrophysical kind of way. Uh, so on the far left, you have a, a contours of basically Stokes I, which is the total intensity. So it's a combination of the polarized and the unpolarized component of the emission. And so you have this, as I said, the stationary radio core and then a jet moving away. In the middle panel, I'm showing you contours of linear polarization, which we denote by Stokes Q and U. And the combination of these two gives these little uh, tick marks, which we refer to as EVPAs, electric vector position angles, which kind of conveys the orientation uh, of this linear polarization is projected on the plane of the sky. And uh, barring relativistic effects and all sorts of complications, you kind of intuitively expect that to be kind of perpendicular uh, to the orientation of the magnetic field. So that's telling you something about the, uh, the nature of the, the, the magnetic fields within the jet. And most interestingly, and most perhaps difficult to measure is on the far right, uh, contours of, of circularly polarized emission, which can be either right-handed or left-handed, depending if it's doing this or doing that. Um, and, and this in carries information uh, about the plasma content of the jet. Uh, and that's a major unanswered question. You know, after decades of jet research, we still don't really know what the jet is made of. Um, and so there's, you know, this faint signal in Stokes V, which, which gives us some handle on that. And a lot of my research focuses on trying to to understand this, this lesser studied component of the polarization. 
which is which is far less than than, than the linearly polarized components. So very hard to detect, uh, but carries potentially, um, you know, really important information about the jet. And uh, and I like this. This is kind of a, I put this together years ago, but I always show it. Um, you know, the process by which we produce circularly polarized emission, we think, is referred to as Faraday conversion. And this is a birefringent effect whereby initially linearly polarized emission produced within the jet can be attenuated in the plasma as it propagates through the jet and converted uh, into this circularly polarized uh, component. And the level of conversion, as I said, is dependent upon the, the underlying plasma composition of the jet. And so I'll talk a lot more about this at the, the final stage of my talk when I get to, to talking about particle and cell. So, you know, from a theoretical point of view, I have a very dog-eared paper from the 70s, um, which kind of laid out the theoretical framework uh, for the process of, of, of radiative transfer, for understanding how this polarization is, is created uh, and how it propagates through a relativistic plasma. And this paper from 1977 is really just a summary or distillation of a bunch of Russian papers from the 60s. Um, but this is basically uh, a, a matrix form of what we refer to as the full Stokes equations of, of polarized radiative transfer. And again, I'm not going to get into the math in any, in any great detail, but you can see the four Stokes parameters that I, that I talked about, I, Q, U, and V. And all of these other coefficients, basically, are absorption, admission, and, and Faraday terms that govern uh, how, how this polarization propagates uh, and how opacity affects what, what we see. And so there's a, a beautiful analytic solution to this matrix uh, in this paper that I, I use and embed into sort of my numerical framework. And the idea is that you consider just one homogeneous cell of magnetized plasma out there in extragalactic space. This solution tells you what you would get out in terms of the four Stokes parameters. And that's equal to what went in from, say, an adjacent cell of plasma. And there are potentially millions, billions of cells uh, that make up these, these, these complicated relativistic jets. And then combine that with the uh, opacity terms and a whole bunch of math uh, pertaining to the effects of Faraday rotation, which is where you can attenuate this linearly polarized emission, uh, and Faraday conversion, which is how you can convert, basically, from linear to circular, all of which is telling you basically information about the guts of the jet, the guts of the plasma, what's it made up of, what's, what's making it tick. And so here at the Max Planck, I very much get a paycheck to kind of sit around and scratch my head and, and, and try and figure out what, is it, what does it all mean? What is it telling us about, about the nature of these jets? And so I work with, with three-dimensional uh, numerical simulations of jet plasmas. So this is just a, a visualization, a snapshot uh, of, of basically the magnetic field structure uh, within one of these jets. And so you kind of have to visualize, you know, doing this radiative transfer through this kind of forest of, of magnetic field, and then trying to, to, to figure out what is the polarization doing, both in terms of a, you know, what it looks like, and also how is it evolving uh, in time. Now, an added complication in terms of the radiative transfer is that the mathematics, the theory is all done in the co-moving frame of the plasma. So it's kind of a local quantity. But of course, we are astronomers, and so one needs to convert that from these sort of um, you know, cell-specific coordinates into a generalized observer's frame. And so when I do these calculations, I'm continually rotating um, the polarization basis uh, from an initially uh, you know, cell-specific orientation onto a generalized uh, observer's frame, and then kind of rotating back and forth. So it's a, it's a lot of bookkeeping, and there are different ways one can go about doing this. Um, uh, but, uh, but it can be done. And, uh, and that's, you know, thinking about, you know, propagating along one ray from one cell of magnetized plasma to the next. But of course, when we talk about imaging, what I'm doing is casting millions of rays, pixel by pixel, uh, to build up uh, these Stokes parameter maps, so these, these synchrotron emission um, maps that, that we want to compare to the observations. And so if you do that uh, for this jet simulation, you get something like this. So again, to kind of orient you, the jet is propagating um, from kind of the top to the bottom. And we have a highly toroidal magnetic field. So that's kind of a magnetic field that's wrapped around the jet axis. And so what we see when we do these types of calculations uh, is that we get a highly edge brightened jet. So we're looking at kind of a, a high inclination to the jet axis. Uh, so this is a Stokes I uh, emission map. Now here's the same sing, the same uh, simulation, but looking at it in, in circularly polarized emission. This is, this is Stokes V. And in terms of the intrinsic component, it very nicely picks out 
the line of sight magnetic field. So the Stokes V actually really conveys the orientation of the magnetic field, both in and out of the plane of the sky. Um, but um, again, I, I kind of draw your attention to the scale here, 10 to the minus 10. I mean, it's, it's a very, very tiny signal. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to detect. But if, if, if interferometric resolution and sensitivity uh, were no issue, um, I would say Stokes V is the way to go in terms of, of understanding magnetic field morphology. Uh, but as I said, it's, it's very tricky uh, to get. And then here is the corresponding map uh, in linearly polarized intensity. And again, these little tick marks are showing you these, these electric vector position angles, which kind of gives you the orientation uh, of the magnetic field as projected onto the sky. And so you can kind of get a sense of this, uh, uh, this rotation of the magnetic field uh, in, in these EVPAs. So in a, in a nutshell, in a kind of broad brushstrokes, that's what I do. You know, it's, it's running these calculations through plasma calculations to generate these, these Stokes parameters. And then, of course, you can refine these models and then worry about things like, you know, uh, interferometric resolution. You can add uh, array sensitivity, uh, finite UV coverage. There's a whole range of, of things that you can do to make these, uh, these images uh, more realistic. Uh, and, of course, the end goal uh, is to compare these simulations uh, to the images that are now being produced uh, uh, by global VLBI. And uh, I wanted to stop here and just say, you know, uh, just... Uh, uh, you know, my feeling about this, you know, I mean, all of astronomy uh, is, is international in nature, but VLBI in particular, I mean, every station is in a different country. And, and for me personally, I have just been blessed, uh, you know, with my involvement in VLBI to, to have gotten to work with people uh, from all over the world, including your own uh, Carolina here. And uh, I, I've really found that uh, an aspect of this, this discipline that, that, that keeps me going is just, is just getting to meet people uh, who are all, are all working together on, on understanding, you know, these very complex uh, plasma physics that's, that's going on in these sources. And so that's, that's something I, I really enjoy. And so in Bonn, we were talking about this earlier, Bonn is home to the second largest steerable radio telescope in the world, Effelsberg. So it's a, it's a little bit tinier than, than the GBT in, in Virginia, but it's still pretty cool. And uh, I've been fortunate to have had the opportunity uh, to sort of tag along to help out with these, these global VLBI campaigns on a, a number of occasions and actually go up there and sit in the control room and have like a front row seat, uh, you know, for, for VLBI, which is, which is super cool. So I, I took this picture on my first shift, you know, I had all this, this instruction and they're like, all right, have you listening? And I'm like, what? You're not leaving me here. <laughs> you know, you have to kind of keep track of the time. And then when a VLBI scan comes up, you have to press this big green button and then this giant parabolic football field swings around. And so it's, uh, it's super cool. And, uh, and so I've, I've really enjoyed that. And uh, Effelsberg is cool. You can actually go down into the telescope. I took, this is my, my niece and my daughter. I took them down to the very foot point uh, of Eff Effelsberg. And so the, the Stokes parameters are, are in there somewhere. And, uh, and it's actually really cool. They have a whole trail a uh, network of trails around the telescope, all of which are named after different jets. And so I've hiked CTA 102, there's three C279, um, you know, so it's, it's a really cool place. So if you ever get a chance to, to visit it, I, I highly recommend it. So that's kind of just, you know, introduction to, to VLBI and, 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 and simulations and, and, um, and, and synchrotron radiation. So now I'm gonna talk a bit about um, some of the science cases um, uh, that one, one can do with this. And uh, the first of which is the uh, uh, Event Horizon Telescope. Um, so I'd like to touch on this. And so I've been advocating now uh, for a number of years uh, to include Parks 1510 uh, as a potential target for, for, for science um, observations with the HT at one millimeter. And the motivation for that is, uh, you know, from the perspective of trying to understand why blazars blaze, um, Parks 1510 remains one of the brightest gamma ray sources on the sky. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really blazing. <laughs> um, and so the big question we're after, you know, not just for Parks 1510, but for jets in general, is, is what is the nature of the magnetic fields on the scales that we're, we're looking at with, with VLBI? And so going back to the work I did in Boston, you know, we, we worked on several numerical models to try and understand, you know, both the radio morphology, but also the high energy gamma ray emission. And so the model on the left um, relies on a level of magnetic order within the jet, in particular, the interplay between an ordered spine and sheath 
This is a, you know, a high relativistic spine in the center of the jet surrounded by a mildly relativistic or, or non-relativistic uh, sheath that surrounds the jet. Um, you know, the model on the right, in contrast, uh, which also explains these, these standing shocks and these gamma ray flares, uh, relies on a level of magnetic disorder. This relies on, on turbulence uh, within the inner shock region uh, to explain this, this gamma ray variability. And so the question is, you know, what are, what are these radio cores? Are they, are they ordered? Are they disordered? What is, what is the magnetic nature of the very inner regions of the jet, which is where we think these gamma ray flares that we see with Fermi uh, are coming from? So this is work that I've carried on in Boston with, with Carolina. This is one of Carolina's uh, 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 global VLBI images, with the, the GMDA, uh, which really hints at the presence of, of maybe perhaps some magnetic order uh, within the inner region of Parks 1510, perhaps the presence of a, a jet sheath. Uh, and this is one of these ray traced synchrotron emission maps that, uh, that I make uh, shown on the right for, for comparison. And just for fun, this is some artwork uh, that was motivated by this research. This was done by a friend back in Boston. As you can kind of see the black hole and the blazar jet coming out uh, and the shrouding uh, jet sheath. And so we think that you know, global VLBI, we're trying to make the case that the global VLBI, and in particular, global VLBI now with the inclusion of a phased ALMA. And so again, the Max Planck has been very active in sort of bringing ALMA into the VLBI fold. Uh, and ALMA is really a game changer in that it adds a huge amount of sensitivity to these interferometric arrays. Uh, but because of its location at Chile, it gives us this real boost in north-south resolution. Uh, to really kind of create high fidelity um, uh, images of the inner regions of some of these jets. And so I've now written uh, three global VLBI proposals at seven, three, and one millimeter, all of which at some point or another have been accepted um, uh, to, to kind of go after Parks 1510 with a really dedicated kind of full track campaign to, to kind of peer into the inner regions of, of this particular jet. But somehow it got out, I think, that I was a Canadian PI because on the day of my experiment, I got slammed with not one but three snowstorms on three different continents. So it was, uh, it was a real mess and the, 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 the experiment was a complete flop. So you, to you observers in the audience, I salute you. It's, uh, you know, doing observations is a very tough business. And uh, we've had all sorts of technicalities, but we've, we've resubmitted for a third time uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, so we'll see if we can, we can have another go at this. So, but that's, that's kind of the science case that I've been making for, for, for using the EHT to, to go after jets. So I got fed up with the weather uh, and went to Italy. <laughs> so this is a, an image of, uh, of Turin in the Italian Alps, which has become a real hub of, of, of jet science. There's been a lot of Blazar meetings there the last few years. Uh, and in particular, this brings me uh, to the discussion of one of the numerical techniques uh, that I work with, which is um, magnetohydrodynamics. And so uh, Turin is the home of the, uh, the Pluto code, which is a very versatile numerical framework for simulating uh, uh, relativistic jets. And so these are our magnetohydrodynamic calculations. So this is treating the jet as a fluid. And uh, I've got a nice setup here in Bonn. They let me run these, these MHD simulations on the correlator uh, when it's not correlating VLBI data. And so that's a really nice setup because there's no computing queue I can just, just have at it. And so as I showed, showed earlier, these are one of these jet simulations. This is a slice uh, through a three-dimensional uh, calculation of a jet moving top to bottom. And uh, it's color-coded uh, by fluid density with red being high and blue being low. So we think that these relativistic jets are actually under dense relative to the galactic environment uh, that they propagate into. And as I said earlier, you can see these types of uh, uh, conical shocks uh, in three dimensions uh, that, uh, that light up. Uh, in the synchrotron. So again, if you kind of play this game of ray tracing, I can take the, the fluid dynamics and then turn it into to synchrotron emission. And you can really see then how the, how the jet shines at these, these shocked regions. Now, again, this is looking at kind of a, a large inclination to the jet axis, but we can, we can move our camera around and kind of look down the jet uh, with kind of more of a blazar view. And so this is kind of just a, an example of kind of a synthetic radio core uh, from, a, from a, a, an MHD simulation. And so I've recently taken on supervising a PhD student, uh, Joanna Kramer, uh, here in Bonn, who's kind of picked up this research and has, has carried out a kind of systematic survey 
uh, running different jet simulations with different magnetic field morphologies to try and understand the impact uh, that the jet's magnetic field has on the polarization uh, that we see. So this is a, uh, on the left, a poloidal jet simulation where you have the jet uh, magnetic field streaming with the jet direction. Uh, on the far right, you've got a toroidal magnetic field, which is where the, the magnetic field is wrapping around the jet. And in the middle, the middle some sort of middle ground with a, a helical magnetic field where you've got kind of a pitch angle uh, to the orientation. And so Joanne has been carrying out full Stokes radiative transfer, ray tracing through all these simulations and looking at them as, the, as if they're blazar radio cores. And so these are her Stokes eye maps. I don't know how well you can see the EVPAs here, but this is looking at the, the linearly polarized emission. Uh, which more often than not is actually offset uh, from the total intensity image, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then, you know, I like CP. So this is the, the circularly polarized emission associated with these, these different magnetic field morphologies. And so there's all sorts of rich plasma physics that you can look into and understand how it affects the observations or what we potentially are seeing. And I'm happy to announce just this week, we found out that Joanna as, as PI has, has just been approved. Um, she got uh, top ranks for a VLBI uh, proposal with the, the VLBA, a night with the VLBA to, to do dedicated, uh, you know, kind of uh, circularly polarized uh, imaging of a bunch of uh, potential targets. Uh, so we're, we're excited to, to have that as well. So, um, you know, in addition to being a member of the EHT, I'm also a member of the Palami program, uh, which is kind of getting a little closer uh, uh, to Crete. This is in, in, in Southern Spain, uh, in Andalusia. And this is, a, you know, in contrast to VLBI, uh, a single dish uh, campaign. And the advantage of Palami is that in contrast to kind of the global VLBI efforts, which only happen once or twice a year, with single dish, you can, you can do monitoring now and, and kind of look at temporal variability. And so I've, I've recently joined a, a circular, circular polarization tiger team, um, which, is, which is kind of looking both at single dish measurements, but also at creating polymetric images from, from 43 gigahertz uh, VLBI data as well. And so it's, uh, it's, it's been a real learning curve for me, learning about you know, leakage estimates and D terms and gain curves. And I, you know, I honestly don't feel like a tiger. I feel more like a, a cat having a bath. This is really out of my element, but I'm, I'm trying my best to learn. But uh, Joanna's on point, and uh, Yanis is kind of giving us a crash course in, in, in how to do circular polarized uh, uh, VLBI imaging. But from a theoretical point of view, you know, I run my simulations forward in time and look at how the polarization evolves. You can kind of see the EVPA swirling around here with the plasma. And so I'm working to kind of create synthetic single dish light curves uh, for comparison with these observations. And uh, this little red dot highlights a ray, you know, one of these individual rays. And because these calculations are, are three-dimensional, you can look back into the jet uh, and peer into the plasma and see how the opacity, uh, both in terms of synchrotron opacity, but also in terms of Faraday opacity, uh, uh, changes along the line of sight. And so I'm very interested in, 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 in making these sorts of comparisons and trying to understand what is it in the jet uh, that's, that's really driving this, this emission that we see uh, in, in the millimeter. So, you know, these MHD calculations are great, uh, but they, they, have a, uh, they have physics that they're missing. And, and, and the physics that they're missing is that, you know, they're fluid calculations. They're, they're kind of continuum approximations of this, this relativistic plasma. Um, but if you think about uh, synchrotron emission, that's, that's electrons gyrating about magnetic field lines. And so if you really want to get that physics correct, uh, you need to kind of have a particle treatment uh, of the plasma. And so this is where particle and cell comes in. And uh, this brings me back to, to Turin, which is where I met at one of these Blazar conferences, uh, Ken Nishikawa, who's become a very good uh, friend and collaborator over the last few years. Uh, and Ken is a, a specialist in running these, these particle and cell calculations, where you're literally evolving you know, distributions of, of electrons and positrons and protons. Uh, and, and modeling it at the, at the kinetic level. And so this is some research that I've been involved in with Ken that, that made the cover, the front cover of galaxies. Admittedly, it's not the front cover of nature, but I, I think they're super cool calculations uh, looking at the microphysics uh, of relativistic jets. And so the idea is, you know, you still have a grid, but you distribute, uh, you know, a distribution of charges, be it electrons and positrons, uh, across this grid. And then based on that distribution, you compute the fields. You know, you compute the electric and the magnetic fields that then push 
the charges around with you know, the Lorentz force. So you basically then once you've got your distribution, you solve Maxwell's equations, you push the particles, you go to the next time step and then you recalculate their positions and you repeat. And, and from an algorithmic point of view, I mean, it's just beautiful. I mean, it's really first principles physics. Uh, there's very few assumptions that go into it, um, uh, which is very attractive to me um, as, as a theorist, uh, but it is computationally very intensive. Uh, compared to these MHD calculations. And so Ken runs these, these PIC simulations on large supercomputers um, down in the States. And so, you know, what attracted to me, uh, uh, you know, about Ken's research though, is that he's looking at from first principles, he's one of the few people that I know of trying to run relativistic jet simulations um, that are looking at basically plasma composition. So on the top panel, you're seeing basically a, a cut through a three-dimensional electron proton jet, which is propagating left to right. And in the lower panel, uh, a similar jet, but composed of electrons and positrons. And so what Ken's seeing in his PIC simulations, even though they're tiny, is that there's all sorts of different um, dynamics uh, that occur in the jet when you have different plasma compositions. And that's really interesting to me because of course, circularly polarized emission will be sensitive uh, uh, to that. And so we realized pretty early on that there was a real synergy, um, you know, in, in our work. And so I've kind of loaded up some of, of Ken's particle and cell simulations into my, my rated of transfer framework. So again, I've got a normal plasma jet visualized on the left uh, and a pair plasma jet uh, on the right. So there's a complication though, uh, and this is kind of the final part of my talk, uh, which is that, you know, when you do this ray tracing in the fluid framework, you typically make what's referred to as the fast light approximation. The assumption is that the, the light crossing time uh, through the jet is far, far smaller than the dynamical time of these large scale macroscopic flows. And so you can kind of image static snapshots of your simulations, which is what I was showing you before. Now in contrast, uh, the spatial and temporal scales of these particle and cell simulations are so much tinier that the jet is literally evolving on the time scale that it takes light to propagate through it. And so if you're going to get the polarization correct, you need to incorporate this through slow light interpolation. And the way I like to think of this is a hiker crossing a stream. And the hiker is kind of my stand-in for a ray uh, in the stream, the jet. And so if you think each step that the hiker takes across the jet, her, her foot is encountering upstream parts of the flow. And so you, know, you need to properly incorporate that into these, these radiative transfer calculations. And so we work very hard uh, to, to sort of upgrade my ray tracing framework to account for this. So as you have an array sort of propagating through the jet, as it moves from cell to cell, it's, it, it encounters the correct upstream portions of the plasma before you, you produce a, you know, a synchrotron emission map. And so it's finicky, but it, but it can, can be done. And so the results of these calculations are shown here. Um, again, we have jets propagating in this case from, from bottom to top. Um, I wanna emphasize though, this is not astrophysics. So the jets I was showing you before are sort of parsec scale jets at, 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 at you know, astrophysically plausible distances. These are hundreds of kilometers in extent um, and, and placed at you know, literally just one AU from the observer. So th th this is not an exercise in astrophysics. Um, this is an exercise in plasma physics, uh, but I still think there's a lot of really interesting information here. And so these are uh, Stokes I images. So we have a, an electron proton jet on the left an electron positron jet on the right. And again, here's kind of looking at the blazar view of these things. So looking down the jet uh, in total intensity. Uh, here is the corresponding linearly polarized intensity, which is distinct between the two jet compositions. And just for fun, I include an integrated level of, of fractional polarization in the lower right. Uh, and then most interestingly for me here is, is the, the circularly polarized uh, emission, which again uh, is very different in terms of level and morphology between the two jet species, uh, which is exciting. You know, that, that, that kind of highlights the potential of future uh, Stokes V imaging on, on, on micro arc second scales to, to tell us more about the underlying plasma physics of these, these flows. Um, but again, all with a grain of salt because of, of scale issues, you know, which, which remains a problem in PIC. And again, just to finish off these little red dots, highlight these rays. And again, you can play this game of looking back into these, these pick plasma jets now uh, and looking you know, along the line of sight. And so we've done a very careful study understanding you know, how the Stokes parameters in this case vary along each sight line. And, uh, 
And so there's all sorts of information in there. And again, similar to before with the magnetohydrodynamics, looking at the Faraday depths of the plasma, how are those different uh, between a, you know, an electron proton jet uh, or a pair plasma jet on the, on the right? And so I'm very interested in that. And, and Ken actually just got a big grant, you know, similar to observers applying uh, for proposal, you know, proposal writing for, for telescope time, you know, uh, the, the theorists have to apply for computing time. And so we just got a big grant accepted to run larger scale pick simulations to try and address this, this issue of scale and try and inch our way closer to something that, that is more astrophysically plausible in terms of a, a, a relativistic jet first principles kind of calculation. So that's kind of the end of my talk. I'll stop here. I think I've, I've blabbered on uh, uh, enough. Um, we'll open it up for, for questions if you have some. But I, I, my last slide basically is just a, a statement on, on where I think um, you know, things are going. And I think you know, you know, magnetohydrodynamics is great because you can do astrophysics, uh, but you're, you're missing a lot of the uh, important particle physics and, and things like um, shock acceleration, synchrotron cooling. You kind of have to paint that in ad hocly. Um, but so the other side is you have particle and cell. We have all of that done correctly, uh, but you can't simulate, you know, um, you know, astrophysical scales. Um, and so I really think going forward, um, the way is hybrid techniques. And so this is a calculation Joanna's run using a brand new module uh, within the Pluto code, this, this code from, from, from Turin. And so you can see a, a large scale uh, astrophysical jet uh, 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 in the color scheme, but it's embedded within this jet are particles, uh, which are stand-ins for, for electrons, and they're color-coded by particle energy. And so you can see that the particles are, are, are accelerated or energized at, at regions of shocks, um, but they're also cooled as they, as they kind of emit synchrotron radiation, these, these magnetized plasmas. And so this isn't a first principles kinetic calculation, um, but it's, it's kind of a middle of the road. It tries to incorporate the best of both. And so each of these macro particles contains a power law distribution of electrons, um, which is shown here, which is evolving in time. This is color coded as, as the simulation evolves. And so we're now trying to work on, on, on folding this sort of information into our, our ray tracing calculations. And so we've joined the Pluto development team. We're kind of beta testers uh, for this new module. But I think this is a, I think this is a step in the right direction. And so I'm very excited to, to see where this leads. But I'll, I'll end there. Uh, thank you for your attention and, uh, and I'll open it up to questions. I hope you're still there. Are you still there? Tell me you're still there. <laughs> we are still here, okay, good. Uh, Nick. And, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for this uh, uh, very exciting, excellent talk. Um, so now it's time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, that helps with uh, bookkeeping. I guess I got to uh, do this so I can see. Uh, yeah, that helps. So um, Nikki Lafis has a question. So please, Nick, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the uh, your talk. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a few questions if, if we have the time. Sure, please. Uh, in your simulations, uh, do you see mostly conical jets or mostly parabolic? Yes. Jets okay. Near, that's, near, yeah. near the base. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, um, and the answer is I, I don't have an answer to that because these simulations, uh, both in terms of the particle and cell, uh, and and the magnetohydrodynamic, are, are really I wasn't kidding when I made this comparison with the um, you know with the soda pop bottle. You know, so we're doing really just nozzle calculations, okay? Where we just have, you know, at our at our, our inner a numerical boundary, we just have a jet orifice, and we're blasting magnetic field uh, and relativistic magnetized plasma in at that orifice and letting it propagate, you know, um, following the numerics. So the answer to your question uh, is in a whole other class of models, which are these general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic, and more most recently. Uh, general relativistic particle and cell calculations, which are starting from the black hole. And there they are literally self-consistently evolving these fields uh, to launch jets, you know, through Blanford's Nyack, Blanford pain-like mechanisms. Um, and, and I think there's, you know, so I think the, the answer to your question lies in, in those types of models. Um, uh, and I'm not an expert in those, but I think the issue there is, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, work that's being advanced on that, but there's a problem with those calculations from the perspective of jets 
in that they, they have to kind of floor the jet. There's a numerical resolution because the jet, I, again, I wasn't kidding, is very under dense. Um, and so there's a problem with these calculations in that they, they have to cut off the jet, at least that's my understanding of it. Um, but in terms of, of you know, matching up with these, these very detailed VLBI you know, observations of the, you know, the morphology of the very inner regions where we see this, this parabolic to conical expansion, um, I'm not sure that uh, they're able to run these simulations up to the scales uh, where we can, we, can, we can answer that question directly. And so I think that's yeah. to be determined. Uh, uh, the, the, the code that you're using uh, mm -hmm. uses the blandford Znaik me mechanism or the blandford pain mechanism? So again, uh, there is an option. Uh, so the codes that I'm using uh, use neither. So we're assuming somehow uh -huh. that blandford pain and blandford Znaik works and gets uh -huh. a jet going. Uh, and, and all the shape that you're asking about is in that region. But once the jet is going, what I'm interested in are these shocks downstream, which we think map to these radio cores. And so that's been very much the, the focus of our work is to try and understand the physics downstream. Trust that the GRMHD folks know what they're doing and we're focused on the jet. Now, the really exciting thing uh, is that with these new GPU advanced codes, there's the potential, the possibility to do the whole thing in one shot. And that'll be super exciting uh, to see. But I think those sorts of simulations are still in their infancy. Um, and, so. and one last question, sure. if I may, Yanni. Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, um, so uh, you have the magnetic fields, but uh, I did not understand that it is the magnetic field that focuses the jet. Yeah. Even sure. if you did not have them, you would still have these focusing shocks. Yeah, no, that's true. That's absolutely true. So, uh, you know, I don't have an example of that. Um, you know, so, you know, again, synchrotron radiation is my thing. So, you know, I was going for the magnetic fields, um, but you can certainly run uh, hydrodynamic calculations and, and you see these sorts of standing shocks. And again, uh, I didn't touch on this and I probably should have. Um, I don't know if I've got an example, um, you know, but it's all a question of basically the, the, the ratio of, uh, you know, the, the nature of the jet to the ambient medium. Uh, and this is actually a, a weakness to these calculations. If you look at, you know, this is just a, you know, a, an initial snapshot. So you can kind of see my jet just about to blast into this ambient medium. Uh, but you can see that it's just this, this uniform orange. It's just a uniform ambient medium, which is a completely unrealistic, um, uh, you know, thing to do. You know, it's a first cut, but, you know, uh, obviously I have uh, uh, plans to, to make more realistic galactic media to propagate these jets into, which has a huge effect, as you correctly point out, on the nature of these shocks. Um, and so that's, that's something to see. So these shocks are, are definitely there, whether the, the jet is magnetized or, or unmagnetized. Um, but of course, the, it's the magnetic fields that are kind of along for the ride, um, and they're what light up in the synchrotron, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks. Any other questions uh, for Nick? Um, oh. can I? Can I, uh, I I cannot see how to raise my hand because I'm co-host. No, that's that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Can I? <laughs> thanks. Um, so thanks, Nick. Thank you very much. It was very 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 nice talk. Um, so do I understand correctly that with this last, uh, basically last slide that you showed us uh, uh, where you, you are trying to uh, implement a peak uh, in, uh, in Pluto, mm. um, where you, you show us this uh, simulation, yes, exactly, yeah, from, um, um, so do I understand correctly that uh, you, what you, you are trying to do here is also to, is basically to have the same, so you are, you are, grand, you are going to simulate uh, uh, two different compositions for the jet also in ah, this case. Yeah. Or, yeah, no, so that's, that, I mean, that'd be great. I mean, of, of course I would love to, but, um, but no, so these, these, these are not particle and cell calculations. Um, so this is not a, a kinetic scale. So it's it's a you know they're particles, but they're kind of macro particles. So they kind of they represent you know maybe thousands, millions of electrons, you know parcels of electrons. And so what what these calculations are doing is not trying to to solve you know literally electron by electron like the the particle and cell codes are doing, um, but they're basically you know putting particles, we're ejecting particles at the jet, letting them flow through the plasma, and the particles are sensitive to the magnetic fields that they encounter. They're sensitive to the shocks, 
And so there's a, an analytic uh, prescription, I should have the reference here to the papers that, that are written by the Pluto team, um, of, of basically, you know, how does, a, how does a shock energize a particle? Or how does a magnetic field cool uh, a distribution of, of particles? And so those are, those are from where I look at this first order effects in terms of jet physics. You know, you, you need to include synchrotron cooling, you know, because you're losing energy uh, and you need to include shock acceleration. And without doing that, um, it's hard to incorporate without having this, this particle frame, you know, it's a Lagrangian frame with this things bobbing along in the fluid. It's very hard to incorporate that um, without doing these kind of calculations. Um, so this is, this, is, this is not a kinetic scale calculation, although there are modules within Pluto uh, to do just that. Um, but those modules worry about the protons. And again, it's always an issue with scale. Um, um, but again, because of the nature of the Larmor radii, it's hard to do the electrons because they're so much tinier. The, the, the scales of their influence are so much tinier. And so you can kind of do what you're talking about, Carolina, with protons. Uh, but not with electrons, which is what we really care about for, for, for synchrotron emission. So this is kind of a half, this is the middle of the road attempt uh, to, to, mm -hmm. to incorporate this, this physics, which I think matters. I think it's hard to, you know, going back to, to Boston and working with Alan and, and turbulence and, you know, there's no way that synchrotron cooling and, and shock acceleration doesn't matter uh, mm -hmm. to, to the VLBI images. So yeah. we really want to have it in there, but it's, it's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So from this, we are also going to have then synthetic images. Uh, yeah, well, that's, well, you know, so here's the, the trick, though, is that, um, you know, so this is actually, I'm cheating here. Joanne is cheating. This is 2D calculation. Um, so, we, you know, but of course, we can't do anything with ray tracing until it's 3D. But, yeah. you know, each one of these particles, it costs a lot computationally to keep track of it. And so we can't do high resolution particle calculations like this in 3D. And so Joanna has been experimenting with how do you interpolate between particles and, and, and you know, cause you need a uniform grid for the ray tracing. And so it's, uh, you know, and there's people of course within the Pluto team working on this as well. And it's, uh, it's tricky. So it's, uh, yes, sure. we try our best, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thank yeah, no problem, Carolina. Thank you. Uh, John, can I ask something? Because I yeah, can... sure. Sorry, I was muted, so I was speaking to myself. Okay, uh, thank you. But yeah, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much for this interesting talk, uh, Nicholas. Uh, I would like to ask, since you mentioned about the computational time of this uh, mixed simulation, how how is it compared if you do if you uh, run simple fluid uh, simulations? Yeah, the same resolution. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I don't have the answer. Um, because we haven't done it yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So we've done the 2D, the 2D calculation, you know, we've done the 2D and those, those run pretty well. Um, but the, the 3D, you know, we, we, we haven't done anything that I would say is a, a proper calculation yet. Um, and so, like I said, that we have access to this, this, uh, cluster here. And so that's something that we're, we're hoping to, to get back to, but, um, it's expensive. And these, these, these pick simulations, uh, those are, are, you know, that's a whole order of magnitude in, in terms of computational power. And, and they're so intense, you know, both in terms of run times, but also in terms of the data, you know, I, I you know, we, I, they're running the States and we have trouble SFTPing the data back and forth between Europe and America, just because the simulations are so immense. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's daunting uh, to say the least, uh, but we try and find the balance between what, what, what can we work with, you know, in an academic time scale you know, and, and trying to get a, a you know, um, a result out, uh, but also getting enough resolution that it's, that it's meaningful. Um, but, um, but for the simulations I showed earlier, just, you know, the 3D ones that I've, I've run, um, I can run those in, in, a, in a day or two with the resources that I have access to here, which is, which is great. So, we, yeah, but uh, okay. still, still very much a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. that's cool. Thank you. Good. Um, Okay, thanks, Rafael. So, is this something that could potentially benefit from uh, like a GPU accelerator? Abs absolutely, yes, yes, and yes. And there's um, uh, a group. I, I, his name is, is Matthew Liska, who's kind of the the trailblazer for this, the first person to kind of to to kind of take this magneto hydrodynamic framework and getting it working in kind of a GPU context. And the simulations, I, I get embarrassed when I compare our grid sizes to the you know they're doing, you know, many many thousands 
by thousands of, of you know cells in, in each direction. So they're, they're they're vast compared to these. These are baby baby jet calculations in comparison. But uh, I see. But well, so the future is promising, though. Yeah. So thank God for um, video gamers, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so if absolutely. We could, <laughs> if we could get the video gamers and and stop the Bitcoin computations, we could we could figure this all out. But uh, it, yes, you know, resources are what they are numerically. <laughs> Yes, that's true. Um, all right, uh, any last question for uh, Nicholas? Well, thank, uh, you. thank you for having me. It's, it's not, a well, honor. thanks a lot uh, for, um, for this uh, very interesting talk again, Nick, and hopefully next time we repeat it in person. Oh, I'd like that very much. <laughs> Stay safe, yes. everyone. Take care. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Take care. All right, ciao. Uh, bye, bye, everyone. Bye-bye.